And welcome. I'm Amy Woods, Executive Director of Alumni Relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 1997. As I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Zoom at this point, I just wanted to remind you of a few features. As this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting, all microphones and videos have been turned off for participants. The chat box will be reserved for you to send me any technical questions that you might have. Please use the Q&A feature to send questions to me for our presenter. I will try to get through as many questions as possible in the time remaining following the presentation. At this time, I'd like to welcome President Dennis Murray, who will introduce today's guest speaker. Welcome, Dr. Murray. Okay, thank you, Amy. And uh, let me begin by thanking you for all the good work you do with our alumni and uh, Joanne Gavin, Chris Del Giorno, and Iris Ruiz Gretsch for uh, helping to arrange uh, today's event. Uh, I'm Dennis Murray, and I'm, I'm speaking to you from the Greystone Building on the uh, Marist campus right next to our library. Uh, for those of you who don't know this building's history, Greystone uh, was a carriage house built in the 1860s on what was then the Beck Estate. Uh, the estate was later purchased by the Marist Brothers, our founders, and used as their uh, novitiate. In the 1860s, uh, horses were kept on the first floor, carriages were on the second floor, and my office uh, is really virtually in the hayloft. Uh, I like to tell colleagues in higher education, I think I'm the only college or university president in America with a hayloft for an office, but as you might be able to see, it's a great space with uh, views of the Hudson River. And Greystone served as Maris only library for many years and actually became the inspiration for what's called our architectural palette of Greystone and red brick, which you see in so many of the buildings around the uh, campus today. Now, Marist College has a long history of inviting some of our country's most successful business executives to speak to our students and faculty. That list now includes today's speaker, Jose Sill, the CEO of Restaurant Brands International, or as it's sometimes referred to as RBI. And I'm proud to note that Jose has a special connection to Marist. He spent his freshman year, year here before transferring to Tulane University to be closer to his family. Fortunately for us, while he was here, Jose made many good friends uh, and he's followed our success over the last several decades. He was particularly close to Scott McVeigh, who I believe is on the uh, program today, who also serves on our alumni executive board. And we'd like to thank Scott for reacquainting us with Jose. Jose really has uh, an inspirational uh, story and history. He's a son of Cuban, Cuban immigrants born and raised in Miami. After earning his BA at Tulane University and a law degree from the University of Pennsylvania, Jose worked at Burger King in increasingly responsible positions, eventually working his way up to executive vice president and then president of Burger King worldwide. He was responsible for operations in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Jose expanded the chain to more, set than, to more than 17,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries. Based on his success, Jose was promoted to the position of CEO of RBI, a multinational fast food company that owns Burger King, Popeyes, and Tim Hortons, which is one of Canada's largest food chains. He now leads some of the most iconic brands in the world, and RBI has an annual revenue of over $32 billion. Today, Jose is going to reflect on his success in business and his career and offer some advice to students who are just starting out. But first, I'd like to share a piece of advice that Jose's mother gave him many years ago. As a youngster, Jose, as he tells it, wasn't a very strong student. So his mother warned him, if you don't buckle down, you're gonna end up working at Burger King. Wow, was his mother right. He not only worked, ended up working at Burger King, but now he is successfully leading one of the biggest and best corporations in America today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm particularly uh, pleased to uh, welcome back to Marist, a, a member of the Marist family and extend a very warm welcome to Jose Sell. Jose? 
All right, great, great introduction, President Murray. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to Amy and Chris, uh, Joanne as well, and, and the rest of the, um, uh, the Marist uh, College family. It's a, it's a real privilege and honor for me to be here. Thanks again also to Scott McVeigh, a you know, class of, uh, of 91 graduate uh, from Marist and a, and a good friend, someone I've stayed in touch with over the years. As President Murray mentioned, I, I was a, a proud Red Fox during uh, my freshman year. Uh, it was uh, 1987. I came all the way down from uh, from Miami, from South Florida, uh, up to uh, Poughkeepsie. I went to visit the campus um, along with uh, Rutgers and Fordham back in in the summer. I guess it was the fall of uh, of '86, um, and I really fell in love with the campus. Fell in love with the with the school. I was I was interested in communications uh, at the time in journalism, and so uh, I, I felt the combination of uh, of a beautiful campus, great people, and, and a really good, strong program on, on the communications journalism side was really gonna be uh, the place for me. I also wanted to play football, um, which, which I did for the, the year I was there, and, and, uh, and then eventually uh, decided uh, that I wanted to, uh, to get closer to home and, and, and ended up my college career at, uh, at Tulane. But, uh, but it's, it's great to reconnect. It, uh, it, I have tremendous memories and really, really good friendships uh, that, that uh, started back in Poughkeepsie in 1987 and uh, continue to this day. So I'm, I'm really proud and excited to be here and kind of share a little bit about my story and, um, and, and more importantly, kind of the, the learnings from that and, and how they're, they're really applicable to, to all of us that are on this call today. Um, you know, whether you're a student or you're a professor or, or you're an alumni doing something else, um, I think the, the, the journey that I've been fortunate to be on has, um, has really taught me the importance of, uh, of of life lessons that you, you you hear about and learn early on in, in life, but but uh, I've been able to see the uh, the benefits of it. I'd love to be able to to share a little bit. I I think President Murray shared a little bit about my background. I'm I'm gonna just to give you a, a preview of the of the hour or so that we have, or 45 minutes or so that we have. I'll give you some a little bit of background. I'll talk a little bit about the the journey that I've been on professionally. Um, then, more specifically, the last probably the last nine months or so, as uh, as we kind of venture through this new normal uh, that that was caused by the, the global health pandemic, as well as the the government reaction and shutdowns to uh, to that, and how that's affected our business. But more importantly, how it's affected me as a leader, how it's affected our team, and how we've reacted to it. And then I'd love to be able to open it up. Uh, for some questions, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude uh, before we get to questions. I'll conclude with, with some thoughts on on success and what are the things that, that I've seen over the years. Um, you know, be consistent uh, traits or qualities of people that have, have done well in whatever field it is that they uh, that they aspire to to do well in. But uh, but and then I'll open it up for questions and love to hear from all of you or any of you uh, on on any topic. And if we don't get to all of them, I'm you know, um, Amy has my contact information. She can take. Uh, you know, questions and, and put, put you in touch with me and I'm happy to, to continue the dialogue after this session. So as, as uh, President Murray mentioned, I'm from Miami originally. My parents, my parents are Cuban. They came from, um, from Cuba in, in the early 60s. They met in Miami and I, I, I was born and grew up in Miami. Um, he already told the story about, about me not be, being a, a bit uh, precocious as a, young, as a young man and not being a great student. So um, it, it's very true. My mom used to tell me that all the time. Like you keep this up and you don't study, you're gonna end up going to working at Burger King. And, and I'm, I'm always proud to tell her that story often. And, and you know, look, look I, I, it certainly turned out true. And, and uh, I'm really happy and proud to, to have the op opportunity today to represent uh, over 700,000 employees around the world. Um, but more than half of them are Burger King employees uh, in the restaurants and, uh, and the balancer with Popeyes and, and Tim Hortons. After um, high school, I went to college, Marist, then Tulane, then I went to law school. And um, the, the one thing that was, Kind of uh, always clear to me, especially as I as I was working through college. I, I mean, I wanted to be a. I started with the, the expectation, the hope of becoming a journalist, a, a writer. I'd like to write, um, and and then eventually transitioned into uh, pre-law, and then I went to law school. Um, but but what was clear to me, which I'm sure is is the same for many of you, is that um, I, I didn't have much of a safety net. My mom and my and dad divorced when I was younger, uh, when I was 11. Uh, so essentially, my mom raised this um, on on her own. She, you know, at, at some point in early in, in my career in school, she uh, she had three jobs in order to pay for for school. Um, and, and so, for for me, as I was growing up and I was going through school, and, and especially in college, I, I I recognized and realized that there was that whatever happened was going to happen 
uh, essentially uh, uh, depending on the on the hard work and and whatever achievements I was able to to get to. So there was no safety net. There was no nowhere to fall back to. Um, so it was either make it or or not. And so as I kind of moved on in the in the practice of law, um, I had there was an opportunity uh, in, in my just before becoming a partner uh, at the law firm. I, I felt it wasn't the place I wanted to be long term. So I. I, I looked around and there was only a couple, a handful of places in Miami that um, that had really significant legal departments internally at in-house, uh, as they say, in-house uh, corporate uh, counsel positions. So Burger King was one of them. There was an opportunity here um, and uh, and I applied for the job, even though uh, there was no there was no connection whatsoever between my background and experience as a lawyer and, and what they were looking for here at, at, uh, at Burger King. But my, my pitch, if you will, the, the uh, um, the, the argument I made when I applied is that, um, that I, I could I could learn whatever the specific legal issues they wanted me to, to become an expert in. It was they were looking for some, somebody that was expert in patent law, trademark law, and corporate law. I was more of a litigator in bankruptcy, um, but but I, I you know I, I, what I brought to the table was uh, curiosity, uh, hard work, uh, an ability to build relationships, and and I could learn the technical stuff along the way. Fortunately, they. Uh, the person who hired me, who's who to this, to this day remains a mentor and a, and a good friend, Elsie El Romero. She was the assistant general counsel at the time. She she bought into that argument and uh, and and gave me a chance to to, to try something new at, at Burger King as a lawyer. And then a couple of years uh, into my journey, um, the company was sold. I worked on the sale of the company. Uh, it was sold to a private equity uh, group, uh, including Texas Pacific, uh, Goldman Sachs, and, and Bain Capital. Uh, and, and when that happened, uh, as, as, hap as it happens in many companies that are acquired, there was a, a pretty significant shift in, um, in resources. There was a change in structure and organization. New people came in. Some of the old guard, old folks, uh, uh, old guard from the team left the company. Um, and, uh, and, and what ended up uh, happening was is that there was an opportunity in, in operations. One of the, the person who led that team, who's who was a mentor then and continues to be a mentor and friend now, Jim Hyatt, uh, asked me to uh, to leave the legal department and join operations, um, uh, which uh, then uh, created a, 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 a new journey for me altogether, um, where I went into restaurants. I spent six months uh, training in restaurants to learn how our, our BK operations work, how, what, what it meant to open a restaurant, to close a restaurant, to, to do a schedule, to train a, a team member, uh, to work uh, on the Whopper board and, and make a, a sandwich, um, to serve a customer in the drive-through, all the elements to clean uh, to clean the restrooms, all the elements of running a restaurant. Uh, I was able to, to to learn that in the in the restaurants as a team member, all the way up to uh, a shift coordinator or manager of a of a shift. Which, uh, you know, looking back, was a really important um, opportunity for me. It was a lot of hard work. Uh, it was not. The most glamorous work in the in the early days, but it was a tremendous uh, uh, learning for me, and I really enjoyed it because of the the teamwork and camaraderie that you build uh, in, in in running a business like that. You're it's all it's a very fast paced business. Um, it's a it's a service business, it's a hospitality business, it's a people business ultimately, and uh, I really enjoyed that. It reminded me quite a bit of of, um, of my time in sports and you know coming together, creating positive, optimistic um, mindset amongst the team to accomplish a big goal. Uh, being able to do that at, at, at one restaurant was awesome. And then over time, I was able to do it over over a, a, a larger number of, of, of restaurants. So I, I went into operations uh, and I, I led a number of different initiatives in, in the US. And then about 18 months later, I had a chance. This is probably 2004, um, 2000, end of 2004, I was able to, to get an opportunity to to go to Europe uh, and uh, and become a, a general manager of a business unit for uh, on the franchise side in uh, based in Spain, and it is one of those you know another important moment in the, in my journey where I had a chance to to try something different. It was a big risk. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to be any any good at this um, at this type of, of role. It was in Europe. I did speak Spanish, but it's a different Spanish Cuban to Spanish versus. Uh, uh, Castilian is, is quite different, um, culturally uh, quite different. So so it, it really tested a lot of my um, you know conventional wisdoms and, and capabilities, and and it, it was a tremendous learning, and, and it worked out quite well. But it was a big risk. It could have been uh, the opposite, and, and ultimately, 
uh, ended up in a, in a difficult situation, but, but I was fortunate enough to, to do well, to learn tremendous uh, amount of, of knowledge around how to run a business now, not just in the US, but internationally. I spent three years in that role and, and, and led uh, the, the, the growth uh, and the turnaround of the Spanish business as well as um, other markets in Southern Europe. And that helped me um, you know, grow as a, as a professional. It, it helped us as a family as well. I'm, I'm married at that time. I was and still am married to um, my best friend and wife, Annie. We're now celebrating 26 years. We have two kids. Um, they were eight and four when we first moved to Europe. And, uh, and it was a, a really tough uh, move to take them away from, from their home, but it was an incredible experience. They learned uh, so much while they were abroad. My, my daughter today is 24. Uh, she, um, she's a PR and marketing um, uh, employee. She works for a, a PR firm here in Miami and she speaks uh, five languages uh, extremely uh, well and very fluent in, uh, in, I think, three or four of them and, and writes and, and reads quite well in, in, in three or four of them and speaks uh, Portuguese, which she just picked up. Uh, and my son is in, at, uh, at University of Pennsylvania now in his second year as, a, um, as an aspiring um, uh, artificial intelligence um, major. So he's, uh, he's, he's studying uh, a pretty cool uh, major. Anyhow, uh, as I look back to that, that era or that time that I was in Europe, it really helped me um, build uh, the, the capability of, of, uh, of influencing and kind of learning how to work with other cultures and, and, uh, and different types of folks, which, which over the years has, uh, has helped me in, uh, in, in my different uh, roles in the company and, and ultimately in, in the current role that I'm in. I came back from, uh, from Europe in 2008 uh, and I ran company restaurants. So we had uh, about a thousand uh, restaurants that we owned and operated as, as uh, company owned stores. Uh, and then uh, I left briefly uh, in 2010, I left to, to Walmart. Uh, I had at that point in, in my journey, I had reached uh, pretty significant um, milestones in terms of uh, professional growth. I had become a vice president running a pretty big business, but I, I, I felt I could do more. I wanted to do more. Uh, I'm certain looking back on it, I wasn't ready, uh, but but I certainly had the ambition. And um, at that time, um, Burger King, uh, this is pre-acquisition uh, in 2010, uh, we, we tended to, uh, to go outside for senior people. So, so when a big position became available, there was an opening in Europe for the president uh, of, of Europe. There was an opening for the president of Latin America. Uh, there was a, a couple of, of senior positions that came uh, around and uh, we ended up uh, going outside to the market uh, looking for folks with experience, with gray hair. I now have a ton of gray hair, but before I didn't. Um, so I, it felt to me like the, the company uh, at that time, the leadership what wasn't going to be betting on, on someone uh, like me. Uh, I, I needed to learn more. I needed to build more experience. So this opportunity at Walmart came up and I, and I went to Walmart at the beginning of 2010 to run uh, a business, a big business unit there, uh, which is basically all of the super centers uh, and, and Walmart stores in uh, in Florida. It was about a ten billion dollar business and about forty thousand employees. And that move, uh, although in the end it became a, it was a very brief move. It was it was very good for me, very positive for me because it gave me confidence that I that the things I was learning as a leader, as a business person, as a manager of people, um, the things I was learning and applying at Burger King. Uh, which is a, a essentially retail business. It's you know four walls, service, hospitality oriented. We're selling burgers, but and then I went to Walmart with the where the restaurant where the stores are much much bigger. The the SKUs or the, or the items that you sell are much more. Uh, it's much more complicated, but essentially it's the same type of business. It's retail. It's service. It's hospitality. You're you're serving customers, creating teams that do that um, effectively every day. And, um, and, and I was able to apply the same learnings I had at, at Burger King, learn new things as well, uh, and, and find success at, at, uh, at Walmart. That, that helped, gave me a ton of confidence uh, in, in, my, uh, in my journey over, over time. And, uh, and then BK was acquired again, 2010 by a private equity firm out of, out of uh, Brazil and New York um, called 3G Capital. 3G Capital today um, also has uh, control uh, interest in Anheuser-Busch, uh, which is the largest brewery in the world. Uh, it has a control interest in uh, uh, Kraft Heinz alongside Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, back in 2010, they acquired 
uh, 100% of, uh, of Burger King. We, uh, they called once the acquisition took place. Um, they called me to see, they had heard about me through uh, the existing management team at Burger King. They called to see if I wanted to come back and, and rejoin the team and run the European business uh, and, and really transform that business into a growth business. Uh, it was a, a crazy idea because I had just left. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense on paper, but the, to, to me it, was a, it felt like a very exciting opportunity and could be a, a, a game changer personally and professionally um, if I was able to succeed and, and, uh, and deliver uh, on the ambitious uh, dream and plan that we had for the company. So, and, and for that part of the business in particular. And I was there for four years. Uh, it, it worked out really well. We, um, we tripled the, um, the profitability of the business in four years. Um, and we start, and, and it became the fastest growing uh, region for Burger King in the world. Uh, then I became president of, of Burger King globally. Uh, and and I, was, I did that role for four and a half years and we became one of the fastest growing businesses globally. Uh, so, so Europe as well as Asia and Latin America and even the US and Canada became fast growth businesses. Uh, and then about a year and a half, uh, two years ago now, it'll be, it'll be two years in January, I, I became uh, uh, CEO of, uh, of restaurant brands that we, we own. Today we own 27,000 restaurants um, through our franchisees, uh, 32 billion in, in system-wide sales, and one of the biggest restaurant companies in the world. And so I, I, it's, a, it's a huge honor for me and a huge privilege to, to be able to, to do this. And, and, and just about a year into my role as CEO, um, with all the challenges, we're a publicly traded company, so there's a lot of, uh, of uh, disclosure and, 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 and public uh, uh, components to the role, including managing investors and analysts, as well as the media, uh, the business media and, and some of the other media um, that, that has an interest in how uh, public companies are, are, are managed and, and what goes on uh, on a quarter by quarter basis. So in addition to learning uh, that part of the business, I was, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, like everyone else, um, we as a company were thrust into uh, dealing with a global health pandemic, which no one has dealt with before. I think there was some, uh, I've worked on business plans for, for 20 years. Uh, never have I planned for or worked on a contingency plan for, for what we were facing and what we faced uh, as a business or what we faced as a, as a globe over the, over the last um, 30, 30 plus weeks. Um, fortunately, uh, because we're a global business, we had seen it coming and we have been dealing with it in, in, uh, in, early, in the early part of the first quarter uh, in, um, in China. And uh, we saw uh, the impact it had, uh, the government restrictions, the impact that had on our business. Um, and, and more importantly, the reaction that, that our teams, uh, both our franchisees as well as uh, our own uh, corporate teams, the, the reaction, uh, quick reactions that we took to, to protect the health and safety of our team members, protect the health and safety of our franchisees and our guests um, and, and addressing through innovation, through just being creative and, and, uh, and quick uh, decision makers, we, we were able to come up with really good uh, solutions to provide uh, our food quickly, conveniently and safely. Uh, in uh, even in the most difficult of circumstances. So when it, when the pandemic hit here in North America, in, in the U.S. in particular, in Canada, um, at the beginning of March, and we knew by kind of early March that there was going to be a, a pretty significant reaction from the government on on lockdown and and protection of uh, uh, of the of the, the greater public and, and doing the the right thing. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of limiting exposure to, to the virus, uh, we knew that there was gonna be a massive impact on our business, we had seen it already. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, we, that we did, it was, a, it was a big learning and one of the things I've shared most with, um, with folks is, is at that moment, very quickly, like within a day or two of coming to that realization, um, we, I, I gathered uh, our top team and we essentially threw our business plan out the window. Uh, we had a business plan that we worked on. It was an ambitious business plan with growth in each of our regions, each of our brands, um, threw it out the window, um, put everything on hold, uh, uh, immediately uh, paused everything related to capital expenditures, uh, operating expenditures that were outside of the norm. Um, we put a, a, a new list of priorities in place for the business. It, it, um, it became the priority for everybody. 
So we changed individual business plans and said, look, we're, we're in a very um, unique situation here. Um, you know, our business, our franchisees, the health of our uh, health and safety of our team members and our franchisees and our guests is at risk. This is what we're going to be working on. Um, and we, we kind of shifted everything to first and foremost, ensuring that that we had all the right procedures and all the right uh, steps in place, uh, you know, the P PPE, uh, new procedures, the technology, everything in restaurants to be able to ensure that our team members and our um, our guests were safe. And, and that we, we put in things in place like uh, temperature checks at the restaurants for all employees. We we're one of the first firms uh, or brands to do that uh, here in the U.S. We did that because we learned it from, from our teams in, uh, in Asia. Uh, we put in place uh, protective uh, uh, personal equipment uh, to, to ensure that people had the masks. Uh, we had social distancing in the kitchens. Uh, we had contactless procedures in the drive throughs as well as in the front counters and the restaurants that, that remained open uh, for takeout. Um, so that there was a number of, of steps we took to ensure uh, uh, that, that we maintain safety and well-being of our team members. And the one thing I'm most proud of over the last seven um, months or so is how that's become uh, a, a, a rallying cry for the business. We, we, we advertised that, we communicated that um, very early on in, in March um, to, to really give uh, consumers confidence that we were there for them. Even if they had, they were worrying about other things, we were worrying about them. Um, we were highlighting the, the capability of our drive-throughs, our off-premise business. Um, and, and that really helped uh, create a very strong bond between our brands and, and consumers. Uh, at the time, if, if you recall, going back to March and April, with everything locked down, uh, the grocery business uh, took uh, had a huge spike. Um, but, but when you look at the food business uh, in in the U.S., all food, so eat at home as well as eat, eat, eating outside of the house, it's about a trillion dollar business. Rough rough numbers. Um, half of it is. Um, of that demand is met by the grocery uh, business. So their supply chain is, is kind of built for, for a half a, a trillion in volume. Um, and then the rest of it is met by restaurants. So 50% of the of food that's consumed in, uh, in this country is consumed in some restaurant, uh, either in the restaurant or, or takeaway. Um, so, so we early on, I spent a lot of time um, with local state and federal government uh, trying to articulate the, that dynamic, that, that it was impossible to shut restaurants down because we would have a, a tremendous crisis in this country in terms of being able to, to feed Americans. And, uh, and as a result, we were able to maintain our drive-throughs open, our delivery uh, remained open, and, and we became an essential service. That we, not, not just Burger King and Popeyes and Tim Hortons, but we, the restaurant industry, uh, became uh, a, an essential service uh, during the height of the pandemic, and, and it became a, a very important rallying cry for the entire company, the, the, all, all the brands and, and all of our teams, because even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances that, that we've ever faced from a public health standpoint, um, we were taking care of our teams and they were taking care of our uh, of Americans, of our guests. Um, the same was happening in other countries around the world, and that was really important for for the brand um, to, to be able to not only weather the storm, but ultimately um, uh, thrive and come out stronger and better uh, than ever. And we think we will be in that position um, uh, coming, you know, coming out of uh, 2020 and heading into 2021. Other things we worked on inc included uh, ensuring the, um, the, the financial health of our franchisees. We're, we're essentially a franchise business, 99 percent of our restaurants are owned and operated by, by franchisees. They're small businesses, they're entrepreneurs, they're the families that you meet uh, in the neighborhoods that, that you, you live in. They're, they're your friends, many of them. There's, there's countless um, franchisees throughout the country that, or, or Americans throughout the country that have built their, their businesses, their small businesses through franchising and, and they're an essential part of our business and taking care of them initially uh, from a health and safety uh, standpoint, but, but also from a financial standpoint to ensure that they were able to weather the storm with the massive decline in traffic that was uh, that the industry was facing was really important. You know, we obviously worked hard with the government for PPP uh, uh, funding for some of those franchisees that were struggling. We never took PPP money, but our franchise, some of our franchisees did, and that helped uh, during a period of time. But, but ensuring their liquidity in French and their financial health was, was essential, uh, and that was a big priority. Um, 
and then finally, we were really focused on on ensuring that uh, um, that that our communities were being taken care of, and, and we we really heightened our, our giving back mindset in all, in all of our communities, especially in the U.S. and Canada. Um, we were we were the first to come out with Burger King with a, a free kids meal when, when all the schools shut down. We um, we realized that many families in this country um, depend on schools to feed their children. And the schools being shut down had a tremendous impact on that. And so we we came out with a free kids meal program uh, at Burger King if, if parents ordered through the uh, the mobile app. Um, and uh, and that like we so we gave away millions of uh, of free kids meals during a, a stretch of time in in, uh, in March April. Um, at, at Tim Hortons, we gave coffee and baked goods and donuts to um, to all the frontline medical workers. Uh, we took our we have coffee trucks and we took them all around the country to uh, to take care of those that were taking care of us. Uh, and at Popeyes, we um, we had a, a really uh, strong push on on feeding uh, homeless. Um, we, we had a No Kid Hungry program, and we had a program in uh, in New Orleans called Nola Strong, where we gave uh, a, a quite a, I think it was a million plus dollars worth of uh, of free meals to uh, to those in need in New Orleans, which was one of the hardest hit uh, parts of uh, uh, of the country during the height of the, the pandemic back in uh, in March April. Um, so so those became our priorities and. And, and it was really um, quite powerful for us. What kind of wrapping up on on this uh, period, which was a pretty uh, intense period, and, and it continues to be one uh, even today. Uh, we, we've seen the business uh, come back. Uh, it's not back all the way yet, uh, but we've seen. Uh, I think the country has um, has shown, and, and I think the globe has shown a, an incredible uh, resilience um, and capability. Uh, to, to manage through through difficult times, I think people are, are becoming uh, more aware. They're taking care of themselves. The the, the routines, um, you know, in in general, in public are, are are much safer. I think people have, have become smarter about wearing masks, uh, and and that's helping us kind of uh, flatten the curve and ultimately uh, come out of this uh, as a as a country and as a globe uh, in a much better place. Um, we have, um, interestingly enough during the, the middle of and probably the most uh, difficult moments of the crisis one of the things that that we as a team and i, I felt was really important for us for, for me as a leader was to we, we launched in march just before the the pandemic we we had uh, communicated as i became ceo a new vision for the company you can see it back here it's a, we call it our dream it's the uh, our dream at rbi uh, which uh, which I launched in January of 2019, is to build the most loved restaurant brands in the world. Uh, and then as we headed into, into March, um, we, we had always planned to start with a vision and then up, update our, our values. And, and when we, uh, we got to March, right before uh, the shutdown took place in, uh, in this country, we, um, uh, we actually um, changed our values, our core values um, as a company um and and it, it they became kind of the, the the foundation for every decision we made uh, uh as a as a company during the pandemic the, the six values that we established for the company which um you know i, I want to share with you quickly the first is that life is too short to uh, to, uh, to have small dreams so dream big the second one is you value things more when you own them and this is all about ownership, having a, a, an ownership mindset. The third is that your growth in this company uh, is based entirely on what you do and, and how you do it, which is all about meritocracy. The fourth is that a, a wide range of voices uh, and perspectives make us stronger, which is all about diversity. The fifth is that is that we should f always find ways to do things differently uh, to make them better, which is about creativity and innovation. And then finally, and probably my favorite one and the, the one that, that, that I kind of hang almost every decision I make um, as a leader is that you should be a hardworking, good person. And, and that's about authenticity. So in the midst of all this, uh, as, as you're dealing with, you know, countless fires all around the world, um, making tough decisions and many, many decisions every day that, that have pretty significant impacts on, on the business and our franchisees and our team members uh, and our guests, um, I, I found that our team, I, I found first that me, that me as a leader, but, but also um, the, the rest of our leadership team and, and, and other leaders across the, the, the globe, 
we kept leaning on these values, these core values of the company as we made decisions. So we didn't make decisions because of financial issues. We didn't, we weren't driven by a financial outcome. We were driven by the dream that we have to build the most loved restaurant brands and these values that, that are so important to, to how we want to run the company. Ultimately, if we do those things the right way and we make the right decisions for the benefit of our guests, our teams, and our franchisees, we will become a financially successful company. We already are, um, but but the the focus on doing the right thing uh, and and doing things that are based on on your values, not necessarily on your balance sheet or your or your P and L statement, um, it, it has a, a big meaningful impact on how how people view you as a company, as a brand, and as a business, and, and ultimately really drives different behaviors uh, amongst your team. We, um, in the midst of all this as well, thinking about it uh, from a value standpoint, while everyone was working on on just you know staying afloat and, and trying to survive, we we made significant investments uh, in in our franchisees, in our teams. Um, we made significant investments in sustainability initiatives that were really important for. Um, uh, for, for our business, so we, uh, we 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 launched restaurant brands for good, um, and had multiple initiatives uh, around uh, people, planet, um, and food that that are aimed at, at creating a, uh, our brands as sustainable brands that take care of our of our uh, the food quality, the ingredients, our the planet, as well as our, our people in our communities. Um, we we made a significant. Uh, pivot uh, and, and commitment around diversity. Uh, we launched our diversity commitment in, in July of 2020, so several months ago, uh, where we laid out 10 commitments that uh, we felt were, were critical for, for us as a company, uh, including, uh, and, and very publicly we said that we would, for every position, we acknowledge that we, we lack diversity, uh, that, that we, we're not at the place we wanna be in terms of diversity and inclusion, and we made a commitment around uh, creating a, a requirement that every position that's available, whether it's a, a, an undergrad position that we hire from the schools or an MBA or a professional hire, that 50% of the candidates that, um, that we consider uh, need to be from uh, demonstrably diverse uh, groups. Um, we've since uh, communicated internally to our teams that we've made a ton of progress on that. We're actually ahead of where we, where, where we said we would be. We said 50% and we're uh, ahead of that. And what's great is that that's translated to actually hiring more diverse people. So having a, uh, the, the premise was that having a pipeline of diverse candidates will necessarily lead to uh, having more diverse hires. And, and it's actually playing out uh, that way so far in the, in the data. So th that's kind of the, the journey that, we, that I've been on uh, and, and the last uh, you know, several it's probably seven or eight months that, that have been incredibly intense. Um, I, I've been very proud of the work our teams have done. And, and you can see all of this. Um, since we're a public company, we've shared um, uh, a lot of this information uh, through open letters. I've written open letters to, uh, to our stakeholders and shareholders and, and team members and franchisees. They're available on our, our website, uh, rbi.com. Uh, so you can see kind of the journey that we've been on since the beginning of uh, uh, of March, uh, and you can see our our dream, our our values, our diversity commitment, and uh, and all these open letters, and, and you, you can see how the the business and and the brand and, and our our teams have evolved uh, during these uh, incredible times. To wrap up, um, I've kind of I, I wrote down some some notes here because I think over over a lifetime, you know, I'm 51 years old now. It feels like I've uh, I've done uh, a quite a bit, but it, but it also feels like I'm just in the early days uh, of my journey. I still feel um, like I have a lot more to do. I, I'm more excited than ever about the business that I'm in, the team that I work with, and the, the brand, the incredible iconic brands that, that I have the privilege to, uh, to lead. Um, but, but on occasion, I have the opportunity to kind of reflect and think back. And, and, and one of the things I, I, I really uh, obsess about is, is how you know, what are the things that make people successful? Um, so whether you, you, I'm not saying that I'm successful or not, but when you think about people that are successful, that have accomplished uh, big things, I think there's a number of co common 
traits and qualities that um, that are very much within all of our reach. These aren't you know, n none of the folks that have reached um, uh, pinnacles in their in their professional uh, careers. None of them were, were purely born with it, right? You can you can argue that that Usain Bolt was was gifted with tremendous speed, and, and as a result, he's uh, uh, you know he is who he is, and is the, the world's greatest sprinter of all time. He worked quite hard to get there, but I, I'm not talking about athletic achievement um, only. I'm, I'm talking about across the board people that are successful. My my conclusion from from years of, uh, of, of working with many successful people and seeing them across the board is that it's completely uh, achievable and attainable by everyone. It's really within your reach. It's a, it's a question of, of how much you want it and, and, and what you do uh, to get there. And I think there, there are very common traits uh, or consistent traits uh, amongst all these successful people that, that, that I'd like to close with. And then we can open, open it up for some questions. I think we have, we have some minutes. So I, I think the first trait um, is that successful people dream big it's why it's one of our uh that's what it's our, our it's our number one value as a company i really truly believe that that it's hard to be successful if you dream small um and and it it, it really it, it takes the same amount of energy right whether you dream big or dream small it's the same it's the same amount of energy so i i do think firmly that anybody who's done anything meaningful in their respective uh careers i think and and, and, and professions it's because they have big aspirations. And, and I would submit to all of you that that's a really important thing um, to, to, to think big, dream big. Uh, it doesn't mean you can get there uh, in one fell swoop, but, but you, you need to have big aspirations to do something big. And I think you should go for it. I think the, the second uh, common trait that I, that I see is I, a lot of people say you should, you should do what you love. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, if I, I, I love playing golf and, uh, um, and wine. I'm, I'm not good at golf and I have a difficult time identifying wines from the right regions, but I enjoy it. Um, I really love them, but, but I, I don't think I would be successful in either of those ventures. I, my, my view is have a slightly different twist on it. I think, I think everyone should love what they do, um, meaning that you should come to, to, to what you do every day with passion, with engagement, um, with commitment, with dedication, like go all in all the time. And I, I think people that that love what they do, people that are all in all the time, really uh, accomplish big things uh, in those uh, in, in their journeys. Um, number three, uh, take risks. Um, that, that's a that's something I, I see quite often. I, I, I share with you my journey um, because I think it's. Uh, it, it's, there's plenty of journeys similar or, or, or maybe even different, but in all journeys uh, where people uh, reach certain um, positions in, in, their, in their businesses, um, they take risks. Um, sometimes they fail and it's okay, don't be, but, but you're, you, you can't be afraid to fail because then it's really hard to do something and accomplish something if you don't take those, those chances. And I, my, my, um, one of my favorite quotes um, is a is a Wayne Gretzky, uh, the, the you know the, the the iconic Canadian. I had a chance to meet him. He's a, he's one of our uh, big um, uh, proponents in in Canada, with Tim Hortons, and we've done a number of campaigns with him. Uh, and he said uh, a, a while back that he he missed a hundred percent of the shots he didn't take, um, which which is pretty telling, right? Um, uh, so the, and and I think only one thing is is ever guaranteed that if you, you will definitely not achieve your goal if you don't, you don't give it a shot. So, so I think taking risks, taking the shot uh, is important. It's a key to success. It's okay to fail. Um, you learn from those mistakes uh, and, and, and having the, the guts to fail, to learn from your mistakes, I think is really a, a critical step in, uh, in your journey as you, uh, as you move on and, and take on uh, and, and try to do bigger things. Number four, work hard. I don't know anybody who accomplishes uh, big things that doesn't work hard. Um, I, I'm, you know, I still haven't figured out work-life balance, uh, to be honest. But, uh, but I, I know for sure that um, there, there's people out there that are smarter than me that that have better networks than I do. Um, I just don't let them outwork me, um, and, and I think it's really important to put all your effort into everything you do. 
um, one of the things that, that I talked to my son about quite a bit, my son and my daughter, there's, there, there's, there's at times a, a bit of, uh, of, of uh, in, in today's environment with the, the younger generation, that it, it, it sometimes can be perceived to be cool to, uh, you know, to kind of be laid back and not care too much. And, you know, it may not be as cool to care and to work hard. Uh, it's okay not to be cool. Work hard, work, give everything you have all the time. That's a big driver of success. Um, number five, I think we spend, uh, and it's typical in schools, uh, in the education system, I think it's typical in, in uh, or, or uh, you see it a lot in corporate America. I think we spend a lot of time, maybe too much time, trying to correct and fix our weaknesses. Uh, I think it's ingrained in our society and in, in education, politics, and business and corporate America. And I think it's, look, I, I think it's important uh, to, to understand our weaknesses and, and, and to be self-aware, know what you're not good at. Um, but, but if you're gonna be successful, you need to know what you're good at. You need to kind of foster that, develop that, uh, and kind of uh, put everything you have into that because the things that you're really good at, uh, those are the things that are gonna help you do big things. Be aware of what you, your, your weaknesses are um, you know, over time, uh, you, when you start building teams, you'll be able to complement your skills with with other folks that have different skills. Um, so you, you, the, 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 the collaborative team is much better than the individual. Um, the collective is better than the individual. Um, and, and that's why it's important to know what your weaknesses are, but don't try to fix uh, your weaknesses because you're ultimately going to blunt your, your strengths and it's going to help it's going to hurt your ability to really uh, achieve big things. Um, number six, act like an owner. I mentioned that as one of our values. Um, I, you know, I, I think owners behave differently than employees. An employee that works at a, um, at, you know, at an office or a bakery or wherever um, may not care that the lights were left on, may not care that something happened, the alarm went off over the weekend. Owners do because it's their business um, and you act and behave differently as an owner. And in my company, um, with the team I have, I can even young um, new hires coming out of school, that you can tell um, very quickly who, who acts like an owner, who behaves like it's their business, they're making decisions and choices, and they're, and, and they're making sacrifices for the company because it's their company or they behave like it's their company. So behaving and acting like an owner is a, a very strong uh, indicator of success. Number seven, is persistence never give up and i think we uh you know we talk about grit uh, uh, quite a bit and i think uh, you just don't don't quit keep going keep going number eight i think self-confidence is is really important um and and there's a fine line between arrogance and and uh, self-confidence but but having self-confidence believing in yourself is really uh, uh, key, and um, I, I think we all have our stories about that. I'm happy to, to tell some uh, on that front. I want to wrap up quickly so we can have, take a couple questions. Um, I think number nine, connected to number eight, is um, while self confidence is really important, um, it's there's a fine line, as I said, between self confidence and, and arrogance. Don't be arrogant. Um, be humble. And and when I talk about humility, I, I really think it's important, and, and I think it's the ultimate expression of confidence. In fact. Uh, when you're when you're humble you recognize that you don't know everything you you listen you're curious you surround yourself with really smart people you let people challenge your your thinking you're, you're open to debate when you're humble in that way you get better um, because you're always striving for for uh, to improve and, and to get better and, uh, and and i think it's one of the, uh, the, the the one of my favorite quotes of all time is is from uh, basketball coach john wooden uh, that, where, where he said, it, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. And then finally, number 10, uh, be an optimistic, positive, and good person. Um, I, I think this is um, a, an important aspect of being successful, um, even, even if at times it's not very common. Uh, being a good person, optimistic, being kind uh, is especially important, and, and no, at no more time is it more important than the time that we're in. So. Um, that's it. That's my list of 10 learnings over the years. And that's my story. And I'm really happy and proud to have been able to share it with you. And if, if we have a, a few minutes, uh, Amy, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. 
You actually did such a great job. You answered quite a few of their questions already. Um, I do have a, a, a good one here, though. Uh, as a first generation college student, without the safety net of financial support from my parents, I find it really difficult to sometimes stay motivated while keeping up with being a full time student, working part time and the extracurriculars. What advice would you give for finding a good balance and staying motivated to put in the hard work for my future? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, I, whoever asked the question, I admire the, the fact that that your first generation uh, college student that that should be motivation in and of itself, right? The fact that you're you're carrying the the load for a, 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 for your family and and uh, moving and advancing and, and making progress and actually you know uh, going through an education and, and, and accomplishing what you're accomplishing while working, while financially supporting yourself. Uh, I think look, everyone goes through moments where where you you look around, you're tired, you're um, you you wonder you know if there's an easier way to do it. Um, you, you look at other folks that have different circumstances and you, you wonder why you, you were dealt the, the hand you were dealt. Uh, I, I think it's, it's your ability to, to bring yourself out of those, um, you know, those, those uh, dips. Everyone goes, I go through those dips all the time. I think it's important to, uh, to be able to talk, you know, talk to yourself uh, and, and, and really look on what you've accomplished and, and set yourself uh, goals that are Maybe not too long term, but or immediate uh, goals, so that you, when you hit those milestones, um, you 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 have something to celebrate, right? And then take mm -hmm. the time to celebrate when you hit those milestones, so that you don't, you know, that that so that the journey doesn't seem so long. Uh, I could never have, in my wildest dreams, imagined I was gonna, I was like, you know, President Murray was telling me earlier, he didn't ever think he was gonna be a president of a university. I didn't think I was gonna be a CEO of a publicly traded company, um, but here I am, um, and the only reason I got here is that I, I kept myself motivated, positive, optimistic, and constantly working towards goals. Sometimes they were long-term goals, but most of the time it was immediate short-term goals and just have fun doing it. Enjoy yourself doing it. Live in the moment. Don't get too obsessed about what's going to happen five years from now. Live in the moment. Enjoy the moment. Put everything you have into it. Have fun doing it. And, and when you're kind of on that um, low end of the emotional elevator um take take time to reflect on what you've accomplished and uh and and uh and pat yourself on the back for uh, for doing some some great stuff yes because some of us probably wish we were back in that student's shoes right in uh college yeah, again yeah exactly yeah. what's something you learned in college or participated in which you believe significantly contributed to your success um i, I played sports um and that, to me, uh, it, it taught me a, a lot about relying on other people. You know, build, you know, building good relationships. You know, the, the, everyone's played in, in some, at some level, in some sport, at, at, in some team over the years, right? And and you've worked, you've played on winning teams, and you've played on losing teams. And there's a huge difference between the two. Even if one team is more talented than the other, the winning teams usually have a ton of trust. And, and, and they rely on each other, they have good chemistry, there's good communication, um, there's, they're fun, positive, they're, they're engaged, they listen well, they, they're, they're, they usually work well together. I, to me, that, like having that experience over the years um, really taught me quite a bit, and I apply that quite a bit in the context of team building myself, um, in whether it's been you know, in, uh, in Europe, or here in the U.S., um, you know, it, it applies everywhere, right? Creating the right environment, being optimistic, having a game plan, communicating well, listening well, th those things uh, worked well in sports and uh, and, uh, in, and while I was in college and uh, and, I, and I applied um, and I continue to apply today in the, in in my current roles. There's two questions similar. One is about your favorite course in college, but the other is, are there any books or courses that positively shaped your career from college? Um, I, I enjoyed, I was a, a hit, I, I moved into history. I was in journalism um, when I was at Marist, and then I moved into, I took most of the first year courses um, that, that you would take at, at, as a freshman at, at Marist. And then I, when I was in uh, Tulane, where I did my undergrad, or finished my undergrad, I, um, I studied history and political science. There, there were a number of, of history and political science classes that I that I really enjoyed. Um, I, I, I love history and learning from history. I, I read a lot of history books. 
and have in the past. You know, uh, leaders, presidents, generals. Uh, you, you get a lot of um, of good, you know, nuggets of, uh, of of stories that that they went through and and how they apply. I mean, if you you look back and think about Winston Churchill, he, he was essentially a, a, a many time loser in different. Uh, arenas, whether it was in, in the military arena and, and politics, and eventually became one of the most recognized uh, leaders in, in the history of the world um, because of his ability to, you know, kind of uh, rally a country um, and um, the armed forces during the most difficult challenges that that country ever faced. So I, I think there's a ton of lessons to learn in history, um, and, and that, those are the classes I, I enjoyed the most. I, I think the other piece that was really important for me and I think it's important for all of you that are students out there, is, is this the, the, the essence of my, my experience over the years is the essence of, of learning how to problem solve, right? I think it, whether it's in business or in engineering or whatever it is you ultimately end up doing, I think we essentially uh, as professionals become uh, experts, in, we should become experts in solving problems. Um, because when you build a business plan, for example, you, you build the business plan, understanding the competition, the consumer, um, the trends, and then you kind of build your plan to, to accomplish it, X. And then you put that plan in motion and reality sets in. The competition does something different, the, there's a global pandemic, what, whatever happens, happens. And, and then your, you, your job is essentially to solve, understand what the problem is, why you're not achieving the, the the big goals and objectives you set, and then how do you fix it? And I think being able to to learn problem solving, getting to the root cause of what's causing the the issues, and using data to drive the solutions uh, to be able to solve those problems, I think it's a very very important skill to learn. And uh, and to the extent you still have school in front of you, uh, the the more you can take classes like that that can open your your eyes to you know the myth, the methodology of solving problems. Uh, and then apply those um, in, in practice is, a, is hugely important for, for the business world in particular. It looks like we have two minutes left. We'll squeeze one more in. Um, Jose does have to get on to another event at uh, 2 p.m. So we will have to close out at that point. But um, I don't think you covered this in your presentation. Is there anything you wish you had done differently? I, I made a ton of mistakes uh, for sure. Um, I, I think probably the uh, I had a, a really good friend and, and and she was a colleague on our team uh, when I was in Europe. She was uh, the head of HR. And, I, and there was a moment probably, uh, I don't know, it was 10, 15 years ago. I, I was pretty uh, ambitious and I was, I was obsessed with uh, growing, with, you know, having a good salary and the, the right title. And so I, I, I got promoted quite quickly uh, when I got to, and I was in Europe already as a vice president and I was young and all I, all I kept thinking about was, all right, how much more can I make in salary? Um, you know, what can I do? How can, how can I get a bigger title? You know, I, I was, I, I think I was obnoxious and probably quite arrogant in that respect. And, and um, she, uh, she pulled me to the side and somebody was just walked in here. Um, she, uh, Barbara uh, Haim is her name. She, she, um, she pulled me to the side one day and she's like, listen, you, you have a, you have a ton of ability. You're, you're good at what you do, but you're so obsessed with what's next that you don't really see what's in front of you and you're not doing it as well as you could, you could do it. Right. So it was a great lesson for me. Um, and, and I think, I, I think I, I, I would have been much better accomplished more in, you know, in those days in Europe, if I would have been focused on the job uh, and, and just had fun doing it. it, kind of goes back to the question that was asked earlier about, you know, when you get into, uh, you know, those ruts, like forget about what's next, think about what you have in front of you and do it really well and have fun, like enjoy it and be exceptional at it. You can't become, there's not a path to become, um, you know, CEO of, the, of a company um, that, that's perfect. The, the only thing I can tell you for sure is that you have to be great at everything you do, uh, like really, really good. And so that's the one, that's what I would tell my my you know younger self, you know, 25 years ago. I'd say, listen, whatever whatever happens, um, just make sure you you go all in and, and are committed and have passion and and uh, are focused on what's in front of you. Enjoy it, and uh, and everything else will kind of pan out. Perfect note to end on. Uh, for those that we may have not gotten to your questions, uh, feel free to forward them 
to me in the alumni office or to your professor. I know Caroline Ryder is on today. I'm sure she can forward them to me. But Jose, thank you very much. I'm going to turn this back over to President Murray for some closing remarks. Okay, thank you, Amy. And uh, thank you, Jose. I, I, tell you, I didn't anticipate that presentation, but I think you gave us all a great uh, lesson in leadership today. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that because it's a topic I've been uh, very interested in. You kind of showed us that a with the right kind of leader, an organization can have both great values and also produce great food. And in fact, sitting here listening to you, I'm uh, dying for a Whopper. So I'm going to order some <laughs> online with your uh, new tool and pick them up on the way home. Uh, but we are really uh, grateful to you. And uh, since we're in the age of COVID, I'm going to uh, send you the official uh, Marist Red Fox COVID face mask here. So I'll send you a couple of these down uh, to just uh, thank you and give you a small token of our appreciation for one of the best lectures uh, I've ever heard here at the college. So thank you so much. And I hope you'll continue to be uh, part of the Maris family and continue to be a Red Fox. So great thank to have you. you with us. Thank you so much, President Murray. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Jose. Have a great day. You too.